So, in the uh, in the lesson today, we're looking at repentance, and this is actually coming from the Bible class materials. I haven't finished preparing it for presentation, I guess, so that's why uh, my slides are not very good here. But I think you'll be able to follow along, and we'll begin to teach about this. It is. Um, a very large topic as it turns out and I think it's going to be something that's going to take uh, more than one lesson to go through. But repentance is where John the Baptist starts in his teaching to prepare the way for the Lord and so repentance is uh, a fundamental and we can read in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1 that among the elementary doctrines of Christ are the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. And there are a number of other things in there that are a list of what you know constitute the fundamentals or the elementary doctrines, the foundations. But among those things is repentance, and I think that's an important matter to remember that it is the first thing. Repentance from dead works and faith toward God is among the first things that a person learns. We mentioned earlier that in Matthew 3, John the Baptist first introduces the idea and his message is fairly Simple, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Meaning a spiritual kingdom, not a physical one, is here. It's time to change our minds about things. Jesus, for his part, quoted this exactly later in the same gospel of Matthew, verse seven, uh, chapter 4, verse 17. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is how Jesus began to preach. So the message is clear, the message is consistent. John began this in his method of preparing us for the Lord. Jesus continued this when he started to preach, picking up where John leaves off, if you will. The apostles, for their part, did the same thing. You can see in the book of the Acts, I've gathered three different things. Maybe I should move this. I've gathered three different things here in the book of the Acts. First is Acts 2.38, where people first hear the gospel and understand that they need to be saved, and the, the preaching is being done by the apostles. And he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and receive the Holy Spirit's gift, which is your salvation, of course. But this is a message for those who had learned from God in the law, who were expecting the Lord to come, and they needed to repent and have forgiveness in the name of Christ. In Acts 8, there is a man... Simon, who is a Christian, but who nonetheless sins because he thinks that he can buy the ability to do miracles with silver from the apostles. And he tells them that he wants to buy this prop, this uh, ability from them, that he'll give them money. But the apostles' response is that cannot be done. You cannot buy the gift of the Spirit with money. Repent, he is told in verse 22 of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. So this one is told to repent who is a Christian. He is not told to be baptized because, well, he has already been baptized. He is a Christian, but he has sinned. And so the call is for him to repent, to change his heart again. He did it once when he became a Christian, but he has fallen into some sin, and so now he must repent again of that sin. Then in Acts 17, you see Paul preaching in Athens, Greece, where there are not, you know, 
hardly any Jewish people, he's speaking to the Greeks. The times of ignorance God overlooked, he tells them in Acts 17.30, but now commands all people everywhere to repent. There was a time when God was working through the fathers in the law of Moses, and the rest of the world was continuing as it had from the creation. With God dealing directly with heads of households, those that were desirous of him and of truth in various ways that we don't know that are not documented as a rule. But those times are done. Now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Everybody is called to obey the gospel of Jesus now. And that repentance is for every person. Everybody has to change their mind. Everybody has to change their heart, their stance about things, that God is right and, and I was wrong, that you know my way of living was not the way to live. This is the way to live. And I record in Revelation 2 that among the messages for the churches is a repentance again. In verse 5 he said, Remember from where you've fallen, repent. Do the works you did at first. If not, I'll come and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So even a church can be lost if we do not continue in the faith, if we do not adhere to the first love. The love you had at first, the works you had at first. Remember where you have fallen. So there should be a zeal, there should be a work. We must be concerned about one another. The lack of these things is a sin and requires repentance. Well, let's look at the lexicon together. The lexicon, it's just a dictionary. I don't know why they call it lexicon, frankly. But the word for repentance is a compound word that is made of the word after and the word mind. So it is your mind after the fact. The lexicon, therefore, translates it with things like perceive afterwards, especially to perceive something too late. You realized it, but it was too late. Or to concur subsequently, which means afterwards you agree. You didn't agree at the time, but now that it's over, yeah, that was actually right. I was wrong about that, right? And the, the other way of looking at it is to change one's mind or purpose, to change one's opinion and think otherwise. And this is Liddell, Scott, and Jones. It's the standard Greek lexicon for all of the English-speaking peoples. Uh, this is the meaning. It's afterwards perception. You know, the mind or the thought realizes this thing, but only after. There's... Um, in a somewhat well I think it's humorous not everybody does that's fine uh, but a, a humorous thing is Aristotle's metaphysics and everybody talks about the meta in so many different ways now and um, you know the funny thing about it is just that Aristotle's first or the book that came right before that one was called physics so this one was called meta physics because it's after physics. That's all that it means. <laughs> but it's kind of fun because, you know, our Greek word is metanoid. Like, instead of paranoid, it's metanoid. Uh, the paranoid is the person who's, you know, beside themselves, in parallel to themselves, right? Their, their mind. They have two minds, if you will. Um, the metanoid is the person who has a mind after the fact. Like, oh, now I get it. Or, ah, uh, that was right, and I, I got that wrong. I missed that one. That's the meaning of this. So it's kind of fun to think about Aristotle metaphysics. It just means after physics. And this is the mind afterwards. <laughs> it's too late. I mean, you know, that's when we think of all the best jokes. When it's too late to make them. But repentance, therefore, is... You've done something already, right? You're thinking a certain way already. You've been acting in accord with a certain way, and then you come to realize later 
that that wasn't right. That's what it means. Repentance is a change of heart. Um, turning over a new leaf, sometimes we would call. Well, if we look into the scriptures for the definition, this is where it gets fun. 2 Corinthians 7, I think, is the best way to define it. Because 2 Corinthians 7 is doing something, for whatever reason I never thought to do before, but it is giving us a list that defines this. This is the account, 2 Corinthians 7 is, this is the account of how they came to change their minds. The first letter to Corinth, you may recall if you have read it, and if you have not, I'm remind, or uh, I'm giving you the summary now, the Cliff's Notes versions. Um, the first letter records a lot of things they were doing that were way outside of the bounds. And they had a lot of things that they needed to make right before God. And that is recorded. Um, this in Second Corinthians is the second letter to them in which we read that the first letter was effective. They received it and they listened to it and did the things that the apostle called on them to do to make it right. So that Second Corinthians 7.11 can say what it does, which is you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. That is a very high standard, but that's the standard of repentance. You are repentant when you have proved yourself innocent in the matter. Now that doesn't mean you've gone back and recharacterized what you did to make it sound right when it was wrong. It means you are not in jeopardy anymore because you realize that was not right and I will not be doing that. I repudiate my former self who engaged in that activity. That's not right and it should not be done. Now this idea that you have proved yourself innocent, this is not a thing for you anymore. That's how it used to be perhaps, but no, no more. That's not me. That's repentance. So it says in the 10th verse, godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. And we should stop there for a moment. There is a godly grief and there is a worldly grief. A godly grief is when we realize that we've been wrong and we need to make things right with God. It is a grief nonetheless because we've been wrong. We've done somebody wrong, in this case God. We've harmed God and probably didn't mean to do that. And there's a grief there. There's a, a sadness about it. Maybe even a grief about, well, I'm going to have to give some things up. But whatever it might be, that's a godly grief that leads to repentance without regret, leads to salvation without regret. Worldly grief, on the other hand, is regret. That's where I've done something wrong and I know that it's wrong, and I feel bad about that. That's not the same as repentance. Repentance leads to salvation without regret. Repentance leads to you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. Worldly grief is when you feel bad about it, you know it was wrong, there's perhaps guilt, there's shame, but the thing that's missing is you would do it again. There's no repentance. It's not gone. It's not something you're innocent of or no, no longer susceptible to, so to speak. It's still there. It's, the, yeah, I feel bad about that. that that's a bad thing. I'm, I'm ashamed of that. But not enough to stop doing it? Not enough to repudiate that and tell people they shouldn't be doing it? That's not repentance. There's a difference between those things. And sometimes um, I will point out the difference between the response of the Apostle Peter and the response of the Apostle Judas to the death of Jesus, or to the betrayal, rather, their own betrayals of the Lord. Both Peter and Judas betrayed the Lord. Judas, of course, we pretty well know what he did. He led his executioners to him. 
But Peter betrayed him too because he said, I will die with you, but he didn't. He denied him three times. However, Judas's response to this was to go back to um, the people that hired him and say, I have sinned. I have betrayed innocent blood and threw the money back at them. But they didn't care. And then he went out from there and committed suicide. That's a worldly grief. It produced death. However, we want to look at it and feel bad for the guy and feel, ba feel bad for what happened. Okay, but that was not the right kind of grief. Peter, on the other hand, repents, if you will. He feels grief about what he did too. And when the Lord speaks to him at the end of John's gospel about, do you love me? He's asking, are you willing to sacrifice for me now where you weren't before when you betrayed me? And Peter's not too confident about it. But the Lord bolsters him and brings him along. And then he will stand up eh, some days later, about 50 days later, right? On the day of Pentecost and preach in Acts 2. That's repentance. He did wrong in the matter, but no longer. That's in the past. So you can see that they both betrayed him. They both did wrong and had blood on their hands. In fact, we all have blood on our hands. His death was because of our sins. But one of them reacted with, uh, was stricken with grief such that he took his own life. The other was stricken with grief such that he repented. And there is a difference between these two. We should not be fooled by them because you can be consumed with grief and it will produce death. It's a very serious danger. But let's focus on repentance again. He said, see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you. And now begins a list of things. Earnestness, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. At every point. Meaning there are attributes here, or a list if you like it, of the things that make for repentance. And at every one of these um, points in the list, they're doing it. It's clear that they're repentant. That's what he means. So now we can figure out what that is. we go back and, and look at uh, what's written in 1 Corinthians 5, you can see they had somebody among them who was uh, in an ongoing relationship with one of the father's wives. In Corinth, uh, polygamy was the norm for the Greeks, and so his dad must have been a typical Corinthian who had multiple wives, and one of them apparently was good enough for this guy. So he was having a relationship with that woman who actually belonged to his father, um, if anybody. And this is terrible. He has to put an end to that as an individual to repent. But the church went along with it. They allowed it to be so. And even, you know, your average uh, Dimitri in Corinth believed that that was wrong. <laughs> They're like, yeah, you don't do that. That's your father's wife, you know. And that's what Paul is saying. Like, you you guys are going along with something that not even your fellow countrymen think is okay. How could you do this? So that's why he wrote to them what he did. And what we're reading in 2 Corinthians 7 is that they did what he said. But there is a list, right? If you look at it, the list is earnestness, eagerness to clear yourself, indignation, fear, longing, zeal, and punishment. These are the points to consider when it comes to repentance. You're innocent in the matter if you can establish that these things are true in your case. 
That's what we mean. Your repentance is effective. Your your repentance is true if these things are present. I will comment briefly that sometimes people want to know about congregations and what they have done and whether they are faithful, whether they are right. And sadly, uh, it has become a rather simple matter these days. All you have to do is ask them if we can all understand the Bible alike, because most of the churches will say no. I wish it weren't so simple, but it is rather simple to do that at this point. However, what you really need to be looking for is in the cases where things have gone on in the past and something is in the background there and people, you know, and you bring these things up, they will always say, oh, well, that was years ago. You know, I was different personnel. Um, you know, things have changed since that time. That's what they say. But do they have earnestness? Are they eager to clear that wrong? Are they indignant about what happened? Do they evidence a fear of the Lord God and his judgment? Do they long to be with the saints again among the faithful? Do they show today a zeal that is contrary to what was there in the past? Has there been any kind of punishment because of the wrongdoing? These are the things you should look for. And in, unfortunately, the overwhelming majority of cases, the answer is no. No, these are not in evidence. The best thing you will hear is, well, that was a long time ago. Right. And what's the statute of limitation on sin? I forgot. Is it seven years? <laughs> no. Wrong. That doesn't sound like you're repentant. Well, you're judging my heart. No, I'm reading 2 Corinthians 7. Here are the things that you would be saying. If we had done something as a congregation that was a sinful thing, we taught some error and we had a, a whole lectureship based on this error. We had, you know, the Methodist church come and teach their curriculum in our, in our Bible class time period. And somebody asked you about that today. Say that was in the past. What would you say about that, right? Yeah, right? That was wrong. That should not have happened. Right? We certainly would never do that again. And those who did that, you know, are not here any longer. They've been disciplined or have repented. But that's the kind of response you would give, isn't it? If that had been our past, would you be saying things like, uh-uh, no, yeah, we did that. That's, that's a truthful report. That was a sin. We're not doing that anymore. Wouldn't you? That's not what happens when you ask Northwest why they had their marriage relationship workshops where the Methodist Church provided class material that superseded their Bible class periods. You never hear that that was a sin. You'll never hear that was wrong. They won't say that because they don't believe that. Period. If they did, they would tell you so. They don't. That's the problem. So that's a comment, but I think that it's well borne out. Where is the indignation? Where is the eagerness to clear? Where is the fear? Where is the punishment? I'll tell you again, I, I spoke to a couple of evangelists from the area. This was years ago, and neither one of them's around anymore, but I remember speaking to them about um, a former evangelist at, at Northwest, and I, I don't know, I said something about, oh yeah, I remember he had taught this, and they said, oh, well now, why are you bringing up his name? I said, well, I mean, he taught this thing that you just mentioned, you know, and they said, yeah, he made enough trouble, and, and so then I, I decided to, you know, I decided to, well, lay into them a little bit. Well, what do you mean he made trouble? Is there something wrong with him? I said, now, why are you doing this, son? You know, I'm like, well, what do you mean? Did he do something that was wrong? 
Was there a sin involved in this thing? Was he a false teacher? No, they wouldn't agree to any of that. Okay, so you just don't like him, I guess. He seemed like a nice guy to me. I just don't like the doctrine, because it's not God's. <laughs> but yeah, that's the thing, right? Well, you're mad about it, but why are you mad? What, was there a sin? Was there something wrong? Well, they can't say it was a sin, because the congregation never repented of it. They never made it right. They never disowned that. That's why. It's less than useless. All right, so. I think I want to go down to the bottom and say, let's stop here with these definitions for now. I think that the, there's not something after this. Right, there's not. So I'm going to go back to the definitions after a bit. For now, understand that there is coming a uh, an appendix to the commentary that contains these definitions. And uh, the method for this has been, you know, I will grab the lexicon so that we have a, well, where it makes sense, so that we have a definition in the ancient language to understand what's being said there. Um, and then I will try to find this word or words that are uh, the same base. So there might be a noun form and a verb form and an adjectival form, you know, and I'll try to find those in the text and bring those to you as well so that you can kind of see what's happening uh, from the just from the definition itself, from the from the lexicon. But then, uh, always, of course, and whether there's a lexicon entry or not, we use the scriptures to define these words by finding them in their context where they are being used. And we do this with the intent that uh, you can s compare how this is, where it's found, to how it is, you know, where we're reading in Second Corinthians seven and come away with an understanding of the meaning here. Uh, which I think is a very useful thing for, uh, I guess it's more useful for some words than for others. This first word, in, um, earnestness, is actually one of them where it's a lot more useful than others because this word uh, has a whole lot of different translations available to it. Um, it's described in a lot of different ways. And so it's hard to figure out that this is the base word underneath all these linked passages. But that's why I'm doing it this way. So try to show that actually these passages are linked by this root. And so you can understand the meaning behind it by uh, putting these things together. Well, that's the purpose of, uh, of uh, the uh, format of this index, and it's coming, and we will continue to go through these, uh, the Lord willing, as we, um, as we study. But I will leave this with you for now to uh, say that repentance is an elementary principle of the faith, that repentance is the first thing that John the Baptist teaches and the first thing that Jesus teaches and the first thing that the apostles said on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2.38, and the first thing, you know, or part of the, the, the first message that lands in Athens, Greece, and it continues throughout the New Testament, but also that uh, it's defined for us quite well in 2 Corinthians 7, verses 10 and 11. And from here, we have a list of the attributes of repentance, and that is useful for understanding and for teaching and for identifying things. What is and what is not repentance? What will help you and what will really only hurt? Um, regret of worldly grief, 2 Corinthians 7.10, is something you don't want. It hurts, it only hurts, it causes damage. You've gotta be able to let those things go and understand that none of us has achieved a sinless perfection. There's not anybody who doesn't need the sacrifice of Jesus. He died, and it was a terrible death.
because sin is a terrible thing, and we have all done it. That's the bottom line on that. You have to be able to walk away from that based on your repentance. Uh, you can't get rid of that guilt while you're still guilty. Uh, that's extremely dangerous. But repent, make things right with God, and leave that in the past. Because God does. Today, if you are not a Christian, become a Christian that you might be uh, forgiven of your sins, that you might walk with God from now on, that you might have hope of heaven when life is over. You may have no, no need to be afraid of death, but rather understand that there is something after this that is worthwhile and worth living for and worth dying for. We are ready to help you to be baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. If that is today your need and you realize that you are in danger of the judgment. Today, if you are a Christian and have not lived right, we read examples of people who repented, were told to repent, to pray God for forgiveness of the intent of the heart. And I you know, point you again to 2 Corinthians 7. Look at that list and see, can you make this how your response is for the thing that has been done. You must do so if you can. We've got to, we've got to get there as soon as possible, as soon as you can. If we can help you with our prayers, we'll be glad to help you. If we can help you to obey the gospel, please let that need be known now by coming to the front while together we stand and sing the song selected.